like to welcome now to the podium Christopher Glass of Covenant Light High School, Gaithersburg, Maryland. Christopher. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again for, um, for allowing me to have the privilege to be here. It's quite an honor to introduce this man. Um, my name is Christopher Glass, as was um, I said. I am from Covenant Life School in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, I've, like, over the past four years been applying to the five service academies. Um, it is my strong desire to attend the United States Naval Academy and afterward to go on to be in the Marines and serve, um, serve our country in Iraq. Thank you. Dr. Louis Sorley graduated from the U.S. Military Academy in 1956. His Army service included leadership of tank and armored cavalry units in Germany, Vietnam, and the U.S. In Vietnam, he was the Executive Officer, 1st Battalion, 69th Armor, 25th Infantry Division. He retired from the military a Lieutenant Colonel. Dr. Sorle is the author of several books, including Arms Transfers Under Nixon, Thunderbolt, General Creighton Abrams of the Army of His Times, and A Better War, The Unexamined Victories, and Final Tragedy of America's Last Years in Vietnam, which was nominated for, the, for a Pulitzer Prize. Sir, I would like to thank you for your dedication to the service and for your passion to educate your fellow Americans and others around the world. Our great nation will forever be indebted to you, sir. And on, on behalf of Covenant Life School and everyone present here, I thank you. So it's a great program this morning, and I'm very pleased to be here and, and be a part of it. And the opportunity I have in the, uh, just a very short time is to say some things about the war in Vietnam. One of the longest and, and most complex wars our country has ever taken part in, and so you'll understand that what I'm going to say is highly selective and uh, will open up, I hope, some aspects of the war that you may want to talk about. I thought I would say something about the nature of the war, about the conduct of the war, about the outcome of the war, and about the people who fought the war. First of all, one of the controversies that you've heard over the years has to do with the nature of the war, with some commentators arguing that it was essentially a guerrilla war, and with others disagreeing, saying that it was a conventional war, and I think in many ways this is a false dilemma. Because the fact is that in some times and in some places it was won, and in other places and at other times it was the other, and sometimes in the same place and the same time it was both. If you talk to people who have served in Vietnam, you will get a wide range of views as to the nature of the fighting they were engaged in, and the enemy they were engaged in fighting, and that will be because some were in one province, perhaps up near the demilitarized zone, where the nature of the war was, uh, let us say, more conventional, and others who might have found themselves in the Mekong Delta, where for most, most of the time the war uh, was more of a guerrilla-type warfare, and then some who served in the early period will have had one experience, and others who came later will have had a different experience, maybe in the very same province or provinces. And so what you have really is a patchwork of experiences, uh, all of which are a part of the whole. But if you try to reason from an individual experience at one time and in one place, you will only get one piece of that, of that whole. The conduct of the war is, is probably the most interesting aspect of it. It's, uh, it's interesting to think about the war in terms of segments. Uh, I have used for analytical purposes four segments, starting, uh, this involves the United States involvement in the war, starting with 1960. You can pick different starting points, but uh, for those of us who served in Vietnam, we each received a medal from the government of the Republic of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese, and uh, 
on the ribbon of that medal, there's a little metal scroll. And it has the opening date, 1960, then a little dash, and then it's blank after that. And I presume the intention was at some point to fill in the last date. But unfortunately, by the time that date came, there was no longer a South Vietnam for reasons that you know and which I'll comment on a little bit. So I, I, I think the date 1960, which they chose as a reasonable starting point for the first segment of American involvement, even though we'd had people there in various roles before that. So, so I think it's useful to look at the period 1960 to 1965 as the period of a primarily advisory effort of Americans in Vietnam, although we did do other things during that period to include uh, helping the South Vietnamese with communications and with intelligence and with logistics. By the way, the advisory effort that we made during those periods was a very difficult one for the American Armed Forces, uh, particularly for the United States Army, because the people who were sent there as advisors, primarily a senior non-commissioned officers and junior officers, were drawn from the existing units. We had no separate core of people to, uh, to fill that role, so we pulled these people out of our existing units, which meant then that in those units, younger, less experienced people had to step up and do those jobs, and then others backfilled behind them. So this extended period of an advisory involvement in Vietnam uh, took something of a toll on our existing units. So let us say that the advisory period would go from 1960 to 1965. And I picked that date because in July of that year, 1965, President Lyndon Johnson decided to commit American ground forces to the war in Vietnam. A major, major change in the nature of our, our involvement and in the nature of the, of the conduct of the war. And uh, in the spring of 65, uh, some Marine units went, and then beginning in uh, July of 65, major American forces went. So the next period then, let's call the period of the uh, buildup of American involvement in the war in Vietnam. This is combat involvement on the ground, side by side with the South Vietnamese, and as time went on, with certain forces from other nations as well, primarily those from the Republic of Korea. And this buildup continued from the summer of 65 through, um, well, it was finally capped early 1969. And eventually re resulted in our uh, fielding 543,400 Americans on the ground in Vietnam at the peak. Over a half million people on the ground helping to fight that war. So that's the period of the buildup. I end that period at Tet of 1968 because that enemy offensive was a watershed in many ways, including a change of command uh, on the part of American forces there from General Westmoreland, who had commanded from June of 1964 until about June of 1968, to General Creighton Abrams, who commanded from 68 until 72. So from 68 to 73, let us say, that's the period of the American withdrawal and handing over more and more of the responsibility for the conduct of the war to the South Vietnamese themselves, who of course had had the sole responsibility before we became involved. So it's a, it's, it's a change back to a, a, an earlier situation, except by that time they had a lot more combat wherewithal, uh, in many cases a lot more combat experience. We are out of there at the end of March 1973 pursuant to the Parrots Accords, as they were called, which were a so-called peace agreement, theoretically ending the war. But of course, no such thing happened because the North Vietnamese violated the accords from the very first day. And meanwhile, we withdrew as we had said we would. So then you've got the final period, let's call it the denouement, 1973 to 1975, when on the 30th of April of that year, that